Welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast, where we sit down and have real conversations with business leaders that have been where you are. During these interviews, we'll dive into what it takes to improve systems and champion processes that maximize performance. Each week, our trailblazing guests share their experiences and understanding of the workforce to help inspire change, challenge our thinking, and share what it takes to successfully travel the road to profitability. Now here's our host, co-founder and chief evangelist of About Time and WorkMax, Mike Merrill. Hello and welcome to the Mobile Workforce Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Merrill, and today we are sitting down with Melissa Castle, the office manager at Executive Elevator, a multi-generational construction company who provides routine monthly service, repairs, and modernization to electric and hydraulic elevators. Um, this is the second episode that we're recording with Melissa, so we're, we're excited to have her back. And we're going to talk this time a little bit more about the tactics that Executive Elevator uses to compete in a market with larger competitors. So we're also going to talk about their path to digitization and also how to differentiate from the competition and fight back against those larger businesses in your industry. So thanks, Melissa. Excited to have you back on. I am very happy to be back. (laughs) Great. Well, let's just start out real quick and talk about this process of digitization that Executive Elevator's gone through. Um, How are you using this to really uh, make yourselves different from the competition, say, maybe versus five years ago? Oh, well, we as a company have really have embraced technology for a long time. Um, back, you know, Tandy computers and programming with oh, wow. DOS. And we were very early adopters of QuickBooks. We've had QuickBooks since 1997, I think, the, in the, its current form. And then I believe we had something very similar or something by the same company before then, before they split. So um, we've had you know, our hand in technology for a long time in the office, but then trying to get that out into the field was a little more challenging. Um, One of the driving forces in getting us to digitize, especially just paperwork, it was um, preservation of records, right? So we have this huge file room even now that's got like I don't know, probably 20 file cabinets in it that are, you know, the tall, like six drawer ones. And they're just jammed full. And at some point it's like, why, you know, we have to keep these records, but um, especially for lawsuit purposes, if we put in an elevator, you know, they could come after us at any time um, for that, you know, for an installation. So we have to keep the records forever. And uh <sighs> You know, it just, it feels like every time you're like, oh, well, we can let go of those, uh, those records, you know, we can shred those. Uh, The the lawyer comes in and says, I want records back seven years or something. And we're like, oh, well, we read that we could shred them after five. And so we don't have those in the file cabinet. We just had that happen, actually. Normally, when uh, we get served with a lawsuit or records request, they only want a year of records or previous to the incident and so we uh you know we'll keep records paper records back five years well this last records request we had they wanted seven years wow (laughs) and i was scrambling going oh my gosh you know i know we shredded those paper tickets thank goodness i thought ahead at that point and we were scanning and so we had them digitally but that's the awesome thing with digital records is that it's you don't lose that, you don't, and you don't have to store it. It's, you know, digital storage, but definitely takes up less space in your office. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great example, actually. And and now, um, now that it's been long enough that you've got some history digitized, what right. uh, what would you recommend to other companies that um, to kind of keep from stepping in those pitfalls? Is there anything, any lessons learned that you that you gained wisdom on along the way? Yeah, I think um, definitely having a system um, for storage and sticking to it is a big deal. Um, Making sure that whether it's a customer number or in our case, each elevator has a unique number given to them by the state. 
So we do a lot of filing based on that number, something that's unique and creating that system and then sticking with it, or at least being able to convert stuff over if you decide to change. But that way you can go back and find what you're looking for. You know, it doesn't make sense to have, um, a, uh, you know, all of your stuff digitized if you can't go back to it. Mm -hmm. So you're saying get that structure in place and right. then make sure you maintain it. Absolutely. First thing you have to do when you have stuff coming in digitally, whether it's scanned or like for WorkMax, um, making sure that you have that system in place before those forms start coming in or before that paper comes in, because otherwise it's just going to sit and then you're not going to be any farther ahead because you're it's all going to be named weird or you're not going to be able to find it. Yeah. So you're talking file structure, naming convention. Exactly. And okay. just sticking to it, sticking to it. So today with the field having mobile devices that are capturing this data, how does that impact how you organize it and keep track of it once it gets back to the office and up to your cloud instance? I don't know that it changes a whole lot because the same form that was coming in as paper is essentially just a digital form at this point. So it's the same process. The awesome thing with WorkMax is that we're not then putting the, it into our system, but something to look at when you're looking at software solutions for digitization is being able to be mobile in your technology. Uh, we signed with a company, um, gosh, maybe eight years ago. And it turned out to be like this huge disaster. It was the sales guy sold it really great, sounded like a good idea, but it caused us to change a lot of processes in our field that were working. And we had to change what we did to bend to what the software needed us to do, which is never a good sign. If you're having to change your practices to bend to software, you're choosing the wrong solution. That's number one thing. Learn that the hard way. So we lasted six months with the software, but now we have all of these records, six months worth of data in the software that we couldn't get out of the software. So not only did we, we just had six months of loss of data because we made a mistake. So when looking for solutions for things, you have to be really thoughtful about, okay, what if it doesn't work? What if it all goes south? How are we going to recover this important information? Because any data that you collect from the field, in my opinion, is valuable to your business, or you wouldn't be asking it. Yeah, you know, right? We don't ask questions to for th about things that we don't want the answer to. So it's it's valuable data that you need to make sure that you can get out of said software or whatever uh, at a later date if the company goes bankrupt or it just doesn't work. Mm. Yeah, great advice. Yeah, I love I love your your quote. I mean, your very emphatic quote of yes. you know, <laughs> this don't if you're if you're having to adjust everything you're doing to accommodate the way that a software system is set up, then you're you're probably looking in the wrong place, right? Uh, absolutely. And I just chalked that up to naivete in my searching for solutions. You know, it was one of the first big software purchases that I made, at, you know, in our business. And I tell people all the time, if I had made that mistake at any other business, I, I would have been fired. I'm just lucky I'm related to the people I work for because, <laughs> you know, that, that was just a huge blunder. It cost us so much money and time and effort. And it, it was, and it set us back. That's the other thing in making these big mistakes. We went from, yes, we're going to do this in the field. We're going to be digital. It's going to be all paperless. It, at a time it was still really early in the paperless of, you know, revolution really. And we're going to be on the forefront of this because I, I like technology. I trust it, but then to have it blow up so spectacularly, it made us really gun shy going forward. And I think we lost time where we could have maybe put some of this technology in the field and 
we didn't because we were scared of repeating the same mistakes. Yeah, I can imagine. I I know even here internally or in all the different companies that, that I've worked with, thousands of companies over the years, it, it, most of them have made some sort of blunder or mistake or really chosen the wrong thing. And it does make you gun shy. When you lose steam on something like this, when the idea is right, but you just pick the wrong solution, it costs right. you a lot more than just the money and the time. It's It's the... Um, it's the confidence, right? Right. And it's, you know, it was, you know, the people that I worked for, their confidence in me to choose a right solution. So when we came, we ended up kind of going a different route and deciding we're going to build our own app from the field so that our, our guys could put data into the app that would then come back to the office. And that worked decently well, but they were still doing paper. They only had to put part of the information into the app and it wasn't customer facing. It was all internal stuff basically. And um, while that worked for a while, this is the other thing. If you're going to do something like that, you got to know how it works because we hired somebody to write this app. They went MIA. We got hacked by some Russian hackers that put Russian code into our app. And then we're, so it was over a Memorial day weekend my husband and I, over the weekend, had to learn how to be iOS app coders because there was nobody to call to fix it. So <laughs> that was wild. You were your own support department. <laughs> right. So that's another thing. If it's if you don't have a if you're choosing a solution that doesn't have like strong support and you are the support for it, you better know what you're doing. If we didn't, we were luckily able to at least fix it and make minor changes, but we were able to have that application grow in the way that we needed it to. And I don't have the time to, to build it out. You know, we, that's not what we do. We fix elevators. So it was important for us to move away from that say, okay, it served us well for, you know, the five years that we used it, let's, it's time to move on. So you, so essentially you learn from that lesson, Hey, let's find somebody that does this all day, every day. It's their right. wheelhouse and we'll get back to servicing elevators and, ma- and exactly. make exactly. our mark there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> great. Uh, I, I think that's, that's great advice for anybody. I, I know uh, we do see that often where companies want to do their own thing and it's not that that's always a bad idea, but I will say it's rarely a good idea. Yeah, I think finding a solution that you can customize to your needs is more important. And that's, you know, another WorkMax plug here. But that's one of the things I like about WorkMax is that it's customizable enough to be able to not change our processes in the field uh, you know, connect to stuff that we already use and I don't have to sit down and build it. And if I need help, somebody's right there. Mm, love that. So tell me this in, obviously you were gun shy. You were, you know, you, you kind of already had, I always call them burn victims, right? Like you were yeah. a burn victim of the other system and yes. the process. So what did you do to avoid getting burned this time around? Were there, were there extra steps or advice you could give to others? Right. I really, so I think when you're looking at a solution for any problem in your business, really, but in particular, looking at a software solution or a process that needs to be fixed, you have to really drill down to what is the core problem we're trying to solve here and really focusing on what that problem is. I was trying to do everything and revolutionize everything with that last software solution. This time I really honed in on what what problem are we trying to solve? And when I discovered, okay, we just need our guys to be able to fill out the piece of paper, just take the piece of paper that they're normally filling out that's on paper, make it digital and have it come to the office. That's the issue we're trying to solve. And it really simplified this um, idea that, oh, well, it has to track customer issues and it has to make a phone call and it has to, you know, do all of these other things. No, the issue that we are trying to solve is just that we need them to be able to fill out this piece of paper, this form on a digital device. So it comes immediately back to the office. So we don't have to pay our employees to drop paper off back at the office. And that was it. And eventually 
we were able to have it solve other problems as well. There's, you know, always the um, unintended consequences, but in this case, they were good, you know, consequences because they were able to solve some other issues that we were having. But I think really drilling down to what problem, like laser focus, what is our issue? What are we trying to solve? Will this solution do that? I love that. I always say, uh, move the big rocks first, right? Exactly. (laughs) Well, that's great. Well, so in going through that, obviously, um, it it helped streamline a lot of things that you were dealing with manually and other methods um, and supporting your own self when there were issues. What about how? What about using this to help you compete with larger businesses? How do you use this this type of a solution or technology to create a strategic advantage where you can now compete and maybe win over larger competitors? We are a very niche market, you know, elevators in general, and competing against the big guys is is tough. We're not always the the cheapest option. But, you know, we can't compete on price at all, uh, especially now we've we were a non-union company and we've moved to being a union company. So we have higher labor costs and basically essentially the same labor costs as our big competitors, which at least we know they're paying their employees the same amount. But we so, you know, for costs, we can't compete. So we have to look at other ways to set ourselves apart. And when we think about our customers, if they have a problem, uh, it's like what we were just talking about with support. If they call one of the big, you know, billion dollar companies, it's going to take them three days to get somebody on the phone for them to come out and look at their elevator. Uh, For us, you call, uh, our customer makes a phone call, they get a call back within five minutes with you know, a solution to their problem. Somebody's either going to be on their way, on their way tomorrow. We're going to be able to fix their problem. The other thing that we do is we fix stuff that the big guys won't touch. So we, um, I think finding what you're good at is important and sticking to that. So we really specialize in kind of older equipment that maybe you know, one of the big companies will come in and say, well, you need a whole new elevator and all new components because your stuff's just old. And we'll say, well, you don't really need a whole new elevator. You know, your issue is this little little part right here that if you just change this part, you're going to have, you know, way better reliability. At some point, we also say, when they built the building, they put in the cheapest elevator they could find, and that was in 1965. Maybe it's time to to upgrade. But when we do those upgrades, we also don't put in proprietary equipment. Um, we have a a customer right now that we're having difficulty fixing their elevators because they had one of the big companies put in proprietary equipment, and I, I just don't agree with this business model. We can't get the part because the company, you know, the big company won't sell us the part. It's it's obsolete or, you know, backordered or we're not sure exactly what the deal is, but we can't get the part because we're not them. So we our advice to the customer was to call the manufacturer, have them come out and look at the elevator. Well, they won't even come out and look at it unless they sign a one-year contract to for service to come out and even just look at what their issue is. So to extort your customers, to extort people for to make them be your customers, I it just infuriates me. It's not the way to do business. And it's frustrating for us to be able to have to tell our customers we can't fix your problem. Your issue is with the manufacturer but they're trying to extort them into a contract that they don't want. Yeah, that's horrible. <laughs> I can hardly believe that. It happens all the time. They're, uh, one of the other companies is famous for doing a five-year contract, and it's ironclad. Like you, you cannot get out of it. The only way to get out of this contract is in within 
30 days, I think, of the expiration of the contract to, in writing, say that you want to cancel. But you have to know when your contract is being canceled because they're not going to let you know. And then if you don't, it automatically renews for another five years. It's, I, it's a way to keep your customers in perpetuity. But all the time we have customers unhappy with their service company that are stuck in these contracts. And so what we do is we'll put that, we'll say, okay, here's how who you how to call to get the date. Send us the contract, we'll read it. And here's who you call on this date to get out of your contract, and then we'll we'll take you on. We've even had customers say, you know what, I'm just gonna pay both. I'm gonna pay you because you actually come out and do the service. And I'm going to go ahead and pay them because I have a contract, but I'm not going to let them on our property. We've had that happen too. That's crazy. So they're paying double and it, just to get to your service because that's the only way they can get the parts. Right. Because we provide a, a superior service. A, well, what these customers are actually buying, we actually provide. One of the things that we do is the monthly maintenance the way some companies write it, they say, well, it's periodic maintenance. So are they really there monthly? And, you know, we, when we go survey the job, we find that there's no way these people are here monthly because the jobs are so dirty. So if we, we make sure that our guys are there every month, the pit is clean, elevators clean, you know, that our job is being done and our customers are getting what they're paying for. And then the elevator is going to run smoother and they're going to have less problems, right? Exactly. That's the idea. Preventative maintenance, right? Preventative maintenance, yes. Are there any other, so so I love that. You, you're you not, um, It's it reminds me of like an auto dealership. Like when you go, I had to buy a, a new brake light, tail light on my truck. And the, there was one place, they wanted to charge $600 for this tail light. For a tail light. Like LED and you, and, it, and you can't, I mean, it's for one. That's right. just the passenger side. Oh gosh. And it's like, wow. And I'm going through all these things and I had ordered another part and it didn't work. And it had to be the led because the wiring harness was different. And the, and the dealer told me it's going to burn up if you, if you try and rewire that and do it, it's, you know, throttled differently. So the, the circuitry is wired for led and I'm just like, oh my gosh, you know, but at the end of the day, um, it's it's a similar thing where right. you could be forced to pay an exorbitant amount of money for something you don't necessarily want or even need because right. of that, right? I, right, and I think it. Don't even get me started on on auto dealerships. You know, we work in a similar industry, right? Because people don't know how what how an elevator works. They don't know what the parts do. They don't know why their elevator is broken. They can't YouTube. Hey, how to fix my elevator? <laughs> <laughs> and in California, it's illegal for them to touch it because they're not okay. licensed. It's a safety issue. It's a safety. It's a huge safety issue. You can get very hurt. Uh, so I think transparency as a business is super important, too. I, our customers really appreciate that we're very transparent with, with them and what is going on. We have customers, uh, particularly large uh, commercial real estate development company basically they own a lot of properties but they leave it up to each property manager what vendors that they use so we have a lot of their elevators but not all of them and we're always adding more from this particular company because the big companies keep feeding them lines so we had uh one of them in let me think of the job. It's in Pasadena. And the big company says, we need to change the oil in your elevator. Well, elevator oil changes are like a whole other level of fraud. We don't change oil in elevators. It doesn't go bad unless it somehow is contaminated. But that's what the big company is saying. This oil is contaminated. We need to change it. So instead of her saying, telling the big company, okay, you know, you go do this. Because we have one of her, some of her other properties on service, she called us. She said, hey, this big company that services our elevator at this property uh, says that we need to change the oil in the elevator. You know, will you, will you come look at it? Will you tell us? And, we're, you know, we go. Second opinion. Right. Yeah. Basically a second opinion. So we went out. We said, you don't need to change the oil. It just needs to be filtered. 
So we go out and we filter the oil. Three weeks later, same issue. The the big company says the elevators contam the oil's contaminated again. We're like, we just filtered this oil two weeks ago. What the heck is going on? And so we ended up telling her, you know, we can't keep coming out here for the same issue. We need to, you need to, you know, either have them fix it because they're your service company or, you know, we're going to need you to sign a contract with us or, you know, she wanted us to keep coming out for warranty work basically on the initial filter. And we're like, work no, that no, you didn't do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, we filtered it. Something is wrong. They're telling you it's just that it needs to be changed, but it doesn't. This is why they're lying to you. It doesn't need to be changed. It's really expensive. Let us fix it basically. And they just signed service on that job with us. I think that might be another case where they're paying the big company while they're paying us for service. I, I'm not sure if she was able to get out of that contract or not. Wow. So it sounds like, and obviously your industry is a little bit unique, but, but I think, you know, any type of service company, um, they're, they're going to run into some of these issues. Customers surely do, especially with larger organizations, that Sure. Have, you know, big attorneys and, and, uh, you know, ironclad contracts, like oh, you said. Oh man. Well, and it's, it's lovely. As a small business, if you can get your hands on one of the big companies' contracts, read it. That's my other uh, advice to small businesses. Read every word of every contract you sign, especially when you're talking about dealing with large general contractors, because you can sign that contract that says they're not liable for anything. You know, they're not, if they have one issue, one small issue with whatever work that you performed, they don't have to pay. I cannot imagine putting in a hundred thousand dollar elevator and saying, Oh, well, we don't like the shape of the buttons, so we're not going to pay our bill. And if you read the contract, that's what it says. Right. You can't just sign stuff blindly, but you can take clauses that you like from other people's contracts and add them to yours. Mm, there you go. So learn from again exactly. what, what others are doing that makes sense to your business. Okay, well, that's lots of lots of great little nuggets here. This is this is good. I'm I'm sure it'll be helpful to others. So, what about um, what about marketing and other things? Obviously, there's you know there's um, how you handle customer service, like you mentioned, using parts that are more readily accessible. They're not locked into something you can right. get them quickly. If there's a supply chain issue, you've got three or four options where as opposed to one manufacturer that you have to go through and they're late, right? Yeah, exactly. So what about mar marketing perspective? Is there anything that you guys do uniquely? I wish I could say that we were great marketers and we are not. <laughs> uh, we just finished a brand new website after uh, not having a new website for 15 years. Uh, so in the 80s and early 90s, we were in the phone book. We had a big ad in the phone book. If in three counties here in Southern California, and then some lady in Orange County decided that she she got hurt on the elevator, maybe legitimately had a case. We're not sure because she sued every elevator company in the phone book. And we had never even been on the job. We didn't even know, but she served every elevator company in the phone book. And um, I think that was the last time we paid for a phone book ad, right? Because it's at least our deductible for insurance to uh, to fight that. So I think that was the last time we actually did any real advertising. I think as a business, you need to look at who your customer base is. And if they're saying positive things about you, it's going to get around. The, the great thing with our business is that this person owns a hotel, but his brother also owns a hotel and his cousin over here owns a hotel. But they just sold that hotel. So now they also own that one. So they're, and you've provided excellent customer service. So they're going to call you when they're buying a new hotel to come look at that elevator to make sure it's okay before they buy the building. Or, you know, they're going to tell their buddy over here who owns a hotel. Or like I said, that big um, property management company, this property manager is going to say, executive elevator is fantastic. We got our elevator fixed real fast. And, you know, they're going to talk. So word of mouth for us is just huge. And really the only way we've marketed in 
25, 30 years. Well, and that, again, for a service-based company, that that is common where their their greatest uh, their greatest form of marketing is a happy customer, right? Exactly. And I don't, you know, the future for us as a business, we're going through some changes and, um, you know, my dad and you know, the older generation, the one right above me is looking at retiring and my husband and I are stepping forward to kind of help run the business, to run the business, basically not help to actually do it. And, uh, I I wonder what would happen if we did a little more marketing and put some fuel on that the fire from that side because we haven't for so long. And you know, maybe it might make a difference. Well, you need to find a good marketer and I'll listen to that podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we we've had a few. Yeah, we'll we'll have to chat. I'm sure uh, I'm sure you can do some marketing and certainly ramp things up a little bit more and, and expand if that's your appetite. So um, so what about, uh, what about obviously the trust factor is, it sounds like it's really the key to everything you do. You're building relationships with each customer. You want to be a customer for life. Like you said, they grow organically by acquiring other properties or they have connections out of properties. Um, obviously you step up when large elevator companies can't respond quickly. You guys have been able to slide in there and, and serve customers and, and probably gain some that way. Are there any other um, experiences that you've had where you feel like, um, boy, that's, that was a great approach. We, we need to do more of that. I, I actually do. So something that we do unique um, during COVID, we had a, a hotel customer that's in a desert town. So they didn't get a whole lot of traffic before COVID then COVID hits and they got nothing, right? They're just really hurting. And instead of saying, Oh, you're canceled for non-payment, you know, which is legitimate. We're not getting paid. They had been a customer for a really long time and hopefully things pick up, but it wasn't, yeah, we took a loss for a little while on this customer, but she would call me every month and I eventually told her, I'd say, just pay what you can, you know, pay what you can this month. We'll apply it to the oldest invoice so that, you know, we're not going to assess late fees, just pay what you can. And it went from her being afraid to call every month because they didn't have the entire monthly payment to at least bringing some money in for this job without having to cancel them. And eventually they got completely current. It took a year and a half, but they got completely current. They ended up selling the building. They sold the hotel. Now the new owner kept us on as a service company. They pay every month. No problem with the credit card. I don't have to deal with it at all, but just under being a little understanding of situations when they're really trying, I think that was that was huge. Instead of getting upset, oh well, they're really bad payers. In that we do have those, we have those where they just don't want to pay for our service. Definitely have those. But in this case, it was more this hotel is really suffering. They're having some financial issues. Let's, you know, give them some grace. Wow. That's, I, I actually love that. Um, you know, we've had a few occasions here with, with similar customer going through something or, or not getting paid on a very, you know, multi-million dollar contract and, right. you know, ha have to balance, uh, you know, their money and, uh, you know, still go out of your way to be helpful and, and don't punish them for their challenge. And then when they do get back on their feet much stronger and in our case, and, and probably in yours too, um, you know, when, when the opportunity comes up for somebody to ask, Hey, who would you recommend? You're going to be right at the top of the list. For exactly. Sure. And I think that's why we ended up keeping that contract is, you know, because we showed some grace and the owner said, this is our service company. They're fantastic. You know, you should work with them. Wow. That's, that's great advice too. So now, now that you're, I mean, you mentioned marketing is an area that you probably have a gap that you could do more of as you, as you look to take over the business. Are there any other things that you, that you have on a short list that you say, you know, as soon as um, I'm, I really have my hands on the steering wheel here, we're going to make another change or two. Is there anything else that comes to mind that you um, want to do differently? 
we, I, I don't think I need to wait. I have a whole lot of support coming from the top in pushing the business forward and keeping it going, obviously. And we were able to make changes like uh, WorkMax. And, and honestly, WorkMax was not my idea. This, this whole idea of moving away from the app, we were just kind of complacent for a little while. And it was like, well, it's working. You know, my dad was the one that came to me and was like, this is what we need to do. I'm tired of paying them to come into the office. We need to fix this because they make so much money an hour. And, and this is just ridiculous. Figure it out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I need one more thing right now. Thanks. And uh, we looked at several different um software solutions and we he was watching a youtube video it's like hey Melissa, come down look at this one look at this look at what they do so that's uh that's how we got started with workmax it was a tirade from my dad going we got to figure out how to keep them out of the office because they make too much money when they're standing around the water cooler that's exactly how it went <laughs> wow and on our last podcast you talked about some of that so i know oh, yeah I know some of those costs for you and it, it's, it is not insignificant. It is not. <laughs> it is not. Wow. Well, well, this has been so much fun. It's been great having you back on and um, I've learned a little bit more about your business and I, I, um, I'm just more and more impressed the more I learn <laughs> Thank you. what you're doing. It's, it's admirable and it's really actually pretty cool and a rare thing these days in this market, this economy um, to find, you know, gem companies that are out there doing good work and taking care of people. And we try, and, uh, we try, you know, having integrity and grace with, with their customers. So. Yeah. I think that's so important. And you do talk about keeping our customers, having transparency, transparency in what you're doing, making sure they know that they're getting what they're paying for and that you're not overcharging them. And grace when needed. Sometimes it's not, <laughs> but, <laughs> but when it, you know, you can, you, we know, we know when it, it's needed and uh, and just being honest with your customers and giving them good customer service. Well, is there, is there any uh, one takeaway that you would recommend that uh, or at least uh, remind the listeners about from this conversation that you hope they can, you know, file away in their memory bank and pull out on occasion? Yeah, I think when looking to solve problems in your business, just figuring out what problem you're trying to solve is sometimes the the hardest part but the most important part when you what what is the issue that you're trying to solve yeah avoid distractions from focusing exactly. on the main the main thing because right? when you start there when you start with that that issue that you're trying to solve the unintended consequences are generally positive and stuff tends to stack and fall into place where it needs to go love that well that was fantastic well thank you so much again for joining us today had a lot of fun and uh, we'll have to We'll have to uh, give you a few marketing tips and then down yes. the road, we'll have you back on and see how oh, it works. I hope so. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks again. And Thank I look you. forward to connecting up again down the road. Thanks. Thank you for joining us today on the Mobile Workforce Podcast, sponsored by About Time Technologies and WorkMax. If you liked the conversation we had today or were able to learn anything new or helpful, please make sure to follow us on our WorkMax page on LinkedIn and on Instagram at WorkMax underscore and subscribe to the show on iTunes or your preferred podcast platform so you will never miss another insightful episode. Also, if you enjoyed the podcast, please leave us a five-star rating and review and share the show with your friends and colleagues. Your support means the world to us and will allow us to continue providing impactful information with others looking to improve their results in their business and in turn, their life.